What's going on guys? So before I start this video, I know there are a lot of folks who are super passionate about this topic. So that said, let me preface this with, this is simply a technical explanation that I'm trying to deliver in the best possible way I can to explain what might be going on if you have an RV with frame flex. And this is based off of the information I gathered in Indiana. This is based off of information that I've seen on YouTubers who have posted videos on their own units. And this is something that might be helpful. I hope it is, but it might not be. But again, just go into this knowing that I'm just trying to be educational here to help you understand a technical issue that could be impacting some folks who are having this problem. And I'm not gonna say every single person that has frame flex is specifically experiencing what I'm gonna go over here, but it could be something that you're experiencing if you have a problem. So let's go over that. Hang tight, I'll be right back. Okay, so we're in front of our 2021 Coachman Brookstone. This is a very heavy, relatively long fifth wheel, 42 feet long. So it's only two feet shy of some of these super, super long toy haulers that you see. So it's pretty long. It's full profile, so it's very tall and it has a gross vehicle weight rating of 17,500 pounds, something like that. It has a lot of cargo capacity. And just like I've said in previous videos, I am just as guilty of loading up my RV in a way that I think is okay, even though I don't truly know if it is at this point anymore. I put all my stuff right here and then we have a bunch of heavy stuff up here. Washer and dryer, we have Onan generator, we have a huge upgraded mattress, probably weighs 200 pounds. And I didn't realize that mattresses go up in weight like 20 to 30 pounds each year just because of all the crud that falls off of our body and gets soaked into it. Isn't that nasty? So just think about that. Your mattress is getting heavier every year that you own it and especially the more you use it, right? Got a lot of stuff loaded up in here. I've already done a full video on the things that are just in this compartment right here. And I think it, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think it equated to like 600 pounds. Then I have two huge batteries in here, a big, huge inverter, another inverter up front, as well as a bunch of solar on top. So I am actually considering how I can reduce some of this weight just to mitigate the chance that I have any type of an issue because I'm putting so much weight centered in this one area right here, right? I got a lot of cargo capacity, like 3,000 pounds worth. But do I really feel it's safe to put most of it right here considering most of my holding tanks are also under here as well. So this drop frame section, I have two of my larger holding tanks, my black tank and my large gray tank. I have another gray tank back there where my sink drains into, but for the shower and the bathroom, it's pretty much in this area right here. So again, things that you should consider and things that I'm certainly considering. Now, when we talk about where frame flex is occurring, it's usually in this area right here. Most of the people who have experienced it, at least some of them that I've seen in videos, they pull all of this down right here. You basically unscrew it and this whole part can kind of detach and come away. In some units, you might see insulation under there. You might see uh, like aluminum foiling under there. You might see all sorts of different things. But the way this looks, and if you've watched the videos, the reason why fifth wheel RVs are so different than gooseneck trailers is because of what you need to be able to put in them. A gooseneck trailer, for instance, is a large frame, right? Let's just say an I-beam frame with a deck on top of it. And then if you were gonna convert one, let's say into an RV, you would have to build everything up from that deck. So again, if we have our large I-beam here, 12 inch I-beam, then it has a 10 inch I-beam beneath it. On a gooseneck, it still flexes, believe it or not. There's a lot of flex. And I've actually shared some videos in the comment section with folks who believe that like Diamond C and Gator Maid and Big Tex and Texas Pride, that these trailers don't flex. They flex so much more than you might think. And there's actually a video where somebody takes one of the landing gear off the ground just to show how much chassis flex there is. And it's a lot. It was like three to five inches on these trailers. So there's a lot of flex even when they're unloaded. And there's another video from the folks over at GatorMate, I think, that actually load up one of their gooseneck trailers and you can see how it actually flexes. So those are entirely different types of trailers. And understand that because those are trailers that are flat. They don't have this big superstructure wrapping around it that needs to be rigid because of cabinetry, uh, you know, lower cabinetry, upper cabinetry, furniture, appliances that all have to fit right. You can't have an RV 
to where you go over a, an imperfection in the road and all of a sudden everything binds up inside of your RV because because there's no there's no rigidity there. So that's the whole mentality behind an RV being rigid with the frame itself as opposed to just sitting on the frame like you see a lot of other trailers that are carrying a load. But I can guarantee you, my gooseneck trailer, which we'll probably go take a look at here in a second, whenever I put equipment on top of it, there's a lot of flex taking place all the time. The reality, though, is, is I don't care if the trailer's flexing when I have a tractor on it, because the tractor is not going to become damaged because of that flex. And in RV, again, we're talking about wooden cabinetry, we're talking about tile in some cases, I mean, things that if they flex, they'll break. So the reality of how this works is it has to work in conjunction. And I know that there's folks who say you have to make it so rigid that there's absolutely no way the frame is gonna flex at all. And I do believe that's possible. So I don't wanna say that's impossible. I say it's impossible at the weight that these frames need to be to still have the RV body on top of it and still provide the RV or shopping for the RV with the things they're looking for. Right, what do I mean by that? So again, we talked about the frame. The frame has to be able to support holding tanks, right? Because with an RV, if you don't have holding tanks, what's the point? And people are always wanting larger and larger holding tanks. So the center inside of it, a lot of people like there aren't enough cross beams. The reason why you may not think there are enough cross beams when you compare it to like a gooseneck trailer is because a gooseneck trailer doesn't have to carry anything in between the actual I-beams. These aren't just excuses, these are facts. If you look at any RV factory, any RV manufacturer, the tanks rest inside of the I-beams. So you have to have space in order to put the tanks inside of the I-beams. It just, it's just, you know, the way RVs are built. Plumbing, all of that stuff is inside of the I-beams except where it comes up through the floor to be able to feed your sink, your shower, your bathroom, things like that. A lot of the stuff you see in RVs, it's designed to give you as much space inside of the RV as possible. So really focus in on what I'm about to explain right here. If this were a gooseneck, everything would be on top of the rails. Whereas when you look at this, everything's not on top of the rails, right? Everything is integrated into the rails. Everything is inside of the rails. And then the home itself, the structure that you live in and walk around is on top of the rails. So if it were a gooseneck, all the plumbing and all that would have to be on top of the rails and your ceiling height would be completely eliminated because you would have what 12 inches taken out of every aspect of your floor. Now you look at the front overhang area right here. If this were a gooseneck, it's entirely different. So a lot of you saw the videos where I was walking around with the Lippert engineer and I had this aha moment and I talk too much sometimes, all the time. And I realized what was going on and what the fundamental difference is between a gooseneck and a fifth wheel RV are. So you saw these, these boxed sections right here, right? You saw these box sections that come up from the riser and they're way out to the sides here. On a gooseneck, you see how they V towards the center. And again, I'll take you to my gooseneck here in a second if you need to have some, kind of a visual reference of that. Well, the reason why they, they do that is what I'm gonna show you when I go inside of the RV right now. Okay, so we are walking up to the front of our Coachman Brookstone. Right now, there's probably maybe six foot three inches worth of headspace in here. So a fair amount of headspace for most average height adults is what I'm saying. You don't wanna, wanna have your head just barely clearing it. So they want the, the top here to be really tall. So a lot of folks are like, well, why don't we make this like a gooseneck? Let me explain why. So you see this hump right here, and then you see the hump right there. You may wonder why are those there? That is actually the outer frame rails that you see when you looked at the videos of the frames. Those are those boxed sections. Now this has some other stuff above it for wiring and plumbing because again, I have a washer and dryer in here. If I didn't, then these wouldn't be here, but that's how you feed water. Basically they make an area above this enclosure to be able to run things. But that step up right there, if I take all of that off and I peel back any of the wood, anything that's that the carpet's attached to, that's where it's lag bolted into the sidewall structure, right? So in order for me to have the head space I have in here, I need to have some way of getting as deep into the frame section as possible. Because if this were a gooseneck trailer, the floor I'm standing on right now would be above 
that V section, that nose part of the gooseneck. And in some cases, it would be significantly higher, up to 12 inches or more above that section, which means I still need my floor, which is going to be about two inches, maybe thicker in some cases. I still need to put all of the covering on, everything I'm going to do. And if you probably, you know, wanted to grasp what that might mean in here, that means the ceiling would be, instead of being right here, the ceiling would be right about here. I'm, I'm being completely honest. So maybe even a little lower than that. So the maximum height you would be able to get inside of your bedroom would be about that high. There's no way you could walk around in here because now I'm building on top of an I-beam as opposed to going inside of that section that you saw in the RV. So when you saw the two different frames, this has the, let's just say the classic frame, the, the design that they've had for a long time. You saw that space saver upper deck system. Maybe you did. If you didn't, go back and look it out. So Lippert has two different types of frames now. They have the space saver, and then they have the traditional. This is the traditional. This is the previous technology to the new space saver. And they build on it, or Coachman builds on it, because it works for them. They're, they're familiar with it. They feel they do a good job building on this type of upper deck, even though the space saver upper deck is supposed to be like 20 or 30% more rigid or stronger. That said... Um, I haven't had any problems with this, and I haven't heard of a lot of issues with Coachman fifth wheel, so I don't necessarily know if it's a problem for them, because they seem to be doing it right. Maybe I'll reach out to them and do a full video on it with Coachman to see what they're doing that might be different than other manufacturers. Anyways, so the part that you saw that differs in this versus the Space Saver, the Space Saver wouldn't have this step up right here. So if I get down, you can see there's a step up here. Why? Because that's the actual frame of the RV right here. And it goes all the way to the front right there. The space saver, this is flat until you get right to this point, And that's essentially where that big six inch tubular beam is that gives you more space right here. So it lets you build the RV closer to the front versus having to have this big step up right here. But I'm inside of the frame rails right now. So that's the part people might not fully grasp. And, and that's the part that, that I needed to understand is the fact that right now the frame that I'm standing on right here is purely to support, it probably adds some structural rigidity to the entire front upper deck area, but this supports just the floor system that's sitting on top of it. This is those skinnier pieces of tubular steel that you saw in between the two main beams that, that span on the outside of the front overhang section. So that is actually steel framing on the other side here. So this whole area is recessed into it to be able to give you the headroom you're looking for. Now, I told you I'd reference my gooseneck trailer. So let's run over there real quick so you can see what I'm talking about. So before I go over there, I came out to the outside of this portion so you can just kind of get another idea of what I'm talking about. So again, the frame rail that you saw in the videos is right here, right? That bump up that you saw inside of the RV is what goes around the inside and what's bolted into the side of this frame rail. Now, again, this is not the space saver upper deck, otherwise there would just be a large six inch tubular beam right here and these rails would attach to it and then you'd have the thinner rails underneath here that the floor sits on but with this more classic one you have a large boxed section right here then you have another one right around in this area right here this is that step up that goes into the closet but then you have your main beam that runs right here and this is what everything's attached into and then drilled up from the bottom so the floor that i was stepping on inside of this unit is actually probably right around here so you have these large beams on the outside, these large tubular sections on the outside. The floor is actually right here. My foot would have been right around here. So again, that step up you saw on the edge was the frame. That's actually where it attaches to the frame. If this were an I-beam, if this were a large gooseneck trailer, that again, I don't know why people think they don't flex. They flex a lot. There's just not a rigid structure on top of it that's permanently attached with holding tanks and all sorts of craziness that has to rest inside of the frame rails because you can't do that on a gooseneck trailer. There's no room for it. Sometimes you might actually have a torsion tube that goes down the center to actually help prevent it from twisting or flexing as much. But anyways, if this were an I-beam, a 12-inch I-beam, which is most of what your heavier, your heavier goosenecks are constructed with, the frame would go up to here, right? And then you'd have to build the floor on top of that frame to here. So instead of me having my foot right here, my foot would be up here. And then that would eliminate almost all of your headroom. And for most people, it would be a deal breaker. 
if you walk through units that have a traditional fifth wheel frame, because again, the vast majority of them aren't going through any type of issues at all, people are gonna be like, I'll just take my chances. I'll just get this type of frame because I can fit in there. And then again, when we talk about the weight of steel alone, a typical gooseneck trailer, even the one that I have back there, it's pretty much just a frame if you think about it, right? Because there's nothing loaded on it. it weighs about 6,000 pounds, empty. The typical frame on a fifth wheel like this, which is a large fifth wheel with a 10 inch I-beam on a 12 inch with the steel that they've put in place, I'm going to venture to say probably weighs maybe around 2,500 to 3,000 pounds, maybe. It might even be lighter than that, just in steel alone. So if you think about how strong it is, the fact that this trailer has a 17,500 pound gross vehicle weight rating and understanding what they have to do with the frame to be able to accommodate storage and things inside of it for an actual RV, and then understanding where your head would be if you built this on top of a gooseneck, you probably understand why they're built the way they're built, why they're, why they're this type of design versus a gooseneck. So let's hop over to the gooseneck real quick. Okay, so pardon the grass growing around it. We've gotten some rain and grass is growing around everything right now. So this is my gooseneck and a lot of people are gonna say, well, that's not a fair comparison. This thing is, it's a lot smaller, right? It's a lot smaller than your fifth wheel. Okay, so understand the weight on this thing. First of all, at this size, which is about 14, 13 feet shorter than my fifth wheel, it actually weighs significantly more. This frame, as it sits, weighs probably in the area of three to 4,000 pounds more than the frame on the fifth wheel. Secondly, the cargo capacity on here is actually greater. So the cargo capacity on here, well, you can't really compare it because this doesn't have a big home built on it. And then you're trying to figure out what, you know, what le what's left in terms of cargo capacity. This right here has a gross vehicle weight rating. We derated it to 12,000 pounds, even though it's built to be a 19,000 pound gooseneck trailer which means I could easily haul my John Deere 50G on here, which weighs about 11,500 pounds. So this it by itself may not look like it's as significant, but this is what I want you to think about. So when you look at these front beams right here, see they, how they come out into a relatively narrow V, right? It's because you can't put a floor in here. You're not putting a floor inside of these beams. If you look at that beam right there, which is holding the tire, which is actually a cross member, and you put the floor in there, well then you can see how much room you have of headspace that you're saving. But on these super long fifth wheels, they would require like a 12 inch I-beam up here. So this right here is an eight inch beam. Imagine a 12 inch beam that's four inches taller sitting off here, and then you have to build the floor on top of that. This is what I'm talking about. You don't have this type of nose on the front of a fifth wheel because you can't because you would lose all your headroom. It just isn't something that's practical. So the engineering that goes around RVs, fifth wheels specifically, is to get these beams out as far as you can, put a flooring system in so you can drop the floor into the actual beams, and you have headspace. You have the, the ability to walk around up front. Now, another question people might ask is, do these flex? These flex a lot. I actually shot a video, which you should go back and look at. We loaded up a skid steer on here when I first got the trailer and we towed with it. We actually had a Gen Y Torflex or Torsion Flex uh, hitch up front. And we were trying to demonstrate how that worked. And I had a camera pointing straight down on top of here and you could see these frame rails bending like this or flexing side to side. Then go back and look at the videos where I am doing new truck reviews and we tow heavy gooseneck trailers with tractors and equipment. And I have a camera also pointing down towards the back. In all of those videos, people comment on the fact that there's flex taking place, that things are flexing, right? So those are areas that you have to be aware of. These trailers flex, any trailer flexes, but these trailers certainly flex, even cargo trailers flex. The question is, is how is it built inside and how rigid does it need to be to prevent everything inside of the RV from cracking and falling apart? That's the question you have to ask yourself. And with fifth wheels or travel trailers or any type of RV, because they're loaded with furniture that's screwed in and stapled in and nailed in, I don't know if those are the best practices, but it's loaded with stuff that's not really designed to flex very much. These rigid appliances and items that if there is flex that transfers to the inside, 
those things can break. So again, you build something like this, which still absolutely flexes. There's no doubt about it. You build something like this that is designed to carry weight on top of it, you're never gonna experience it because if I load my John Deere on top of here, this can flex all it wants. It's not gonna damage the tractor, it's designed to. But you build that structure that has to incorporate into it, that's the problem that you run into. How do I develop a structure that has to attach in a solid way Load it up with stuff that can't flex. How do I limit that? The only way to do it is to create a unit that is combined. So the two units are working in conjunction, a monocoque style design where they're working together. And then finally, the other part you also have to kind of realize is the differences in how these are built. Again, this right here, I could probably tow anywhere, but I also don't have furniture on it. I don't have things that are super, super fragile. And that's why moving companies, even when they're moving your stuff, they try to get the most plush style trailers they can get to prevent from damaging the stuff that you have inside of the trailer. So again, super, super heavy, even though it's a small gooseneck trailer, this is not a huge trailer with dualies on the back. This is a small gooseneck trailer, still weighs a heck of a lot more. And if you built a fifth wheel on top of this, you could probably do it. You'd have to compensate for that flex that takes place somewhere. But even if you built a fifth wheel on top of this trailer, it would weigh probably in the area of four to 5,000 pounds more than my 42 foot long fifth wheel that's significantly larger than this and that's designed to be an RV. I guess the takeaway here is that every trailer flexes. Every trailer is gonna deal with it. You just have to figure out why a manufacturer is doing something the way that they're doing and that they're constantly evolving and doing things better. You could always add a lot more steel but the question ultimately becomes, is it gonna really matter in the big scheme of things to add more steel if that steel doesn't take into account the natural flexing and the natural movement that's gonna take place? Because if you add a bunch of gussets, and I love welders. I got some of my really good friends, you guys have seen them on my videos, who are phenomenal welders. And welders will typically take the approach to, if I can put something there and it will make it stronger, I'm gonna put it there because it will make it stronger not sometimes realizing that by doing so, you're creating a rigid structure in an area that shouldn't be rigid, that maybe that's where energy needs to transfer to alleviate some of the stress and tension that could ultimately build up. Maybe that's where it needs to go. And by putting a gusset there, you then take the risk that the gusset's gonna fail, the weld's gonna fail, or whatever you attach it to is gonna fail because that's not how it was engin engineered. That's not what the design is, is designed for. You know, we can put structural reinforcement every single place you wanna put it on an RV because that's where you think it should go, but you have to understand, is there engineering behind where it's at? and where it's not at. And those are the aha moments that I sometimes get whenever I walk through these factories and I see what's going on. Does not mean that a horrible weld that breaks because it was just poorly done isn't the responsibility of the frame manufacturer. It does not mean that a wall that's not attached properly to the structure is not the fault of the RV manufacturer. So these are all things we need to think about. Me, I'm reevaluating where I put my stuff. I am, because I understand a lot more now about frames, I understand how they're designed, and I understand that sometimes having super, super, super high cargo capacity works against you mentally because you think that I can just load everything up in here because I have the cargo capacity. And that might not be the smartest idea either. Get your RV weighed, understand where your weight is, understand what could be failing on your RV, whose responsibility it is. If it's the manufacturers, reach out to them. If it's the frame, reach out to them. If it's, you know, a, a component, reach out to them. If it's your fault, figure out what you're doing wrong. Anyways, guys, I sure hope you enjoyed this video. If you haven't had a chance, please take a moment, subscribe to the channel, give me a thumbs up, and we'll talk to you again very soon.